Today's guest is a humble guy who just exudes passion for his animals every time he gets a chance. So let's get the man with the monarch ball on here to do his thing. Hey, Rance, is that you? It is, CK. Good morning. Good morning, and how are you, brother? Man, I'm doing well. Just kind of getting up, getting down, starting the day, and uh, excited to be on the show to share my story. Well, I'm glad you're on the show, and I'm excited to have you on the show and to be doing the show. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, too, am truly looking forward to hearing the story in your own words. I read a couple of, of posts about it, and I thought it was fascinating, and uh, and it's really a great little Cinderella story. But uh Correct. I'm, I'm stoked to hear it from you. So first, before we get into your, your Monarch Bowl, let's uh, let's just get a little background about Rance Meyer and hear how you got into herps. All right. Well, I think, you know, as with most of us uh, that are involved with reptiles, uh, you know, as adults, I think it all started as, as kids, um, you know, just growing up. Uh, you know, I grew up in southwest Kansas uh, with my mother and stepfather, and then I would spend uh, the summer months uh, in Oklahoma, which is where I live now, with my dad and stepmom, but... When I was in Kansas, you know, especially during springtime, it was all about the rattlesnakes. You know, we have uh, tons of prey dogs out there, and the prairie rattlers would uh, den in these prey dog towns, and then in early spring, you know, they'd come out of their hibernation, and, you know, I'd go out there, and they're kind of sitting on top of the prey dog holes and kind of sneak up on them with a snake hook and kind of pull them out of there and then just kind of play with them a little bit, take some nice pictures, and then turn them loose. So, yeah, I was all about that time of the year, you know, back home in southwest Kansas. That's and, you know uh, what that's that's a lot better than I mean not that any any herb story is better than another one they're all really good but they're right. so much more interesting than uh, catching a, a you know a garter snake in your backyard man <laughs> that's pretty right, cool These right. were, this so, was your first experience with like, how old were you when you were hooking rattlers you know I I'm gonna say it was probably about sixth grade I know probably not very wise I'm sure I didn't really know what I was doing I knew they had potential to hurt me but uh, I, I tried to be careful and. Uh, you know, I guess I got lucky, maybe. <laughs> good man, good man. Well, that's, but, that, uh, that's a pretty cool story. Yeah, and then, you know, in the, when I was with my dad in the summer, you know, he had a creek right behind his house. And, uh, and then, like you said, it was kind of all about the garter snakes, you know, leopard frogs, uh, you know, crawdads, toads, you name it. I spent eight hours a day in the creek and then uh, come home with bucket pools of, of all these critters, uh, not knowing exactly what I'd do with them. But, uh, you know, it was... Uh, um, just a daily thing for me, uh, you know, did that, you know, growing up, and then got into college, and, you know, I, I wasn't ever able to keep any snakes there growing up, unfortunately, but, uh, yeah, like most of us weren't, and then when we get older, now now look what happened. <laughs> yeah, you saw our parents fool, so, man. They should have let you have one right. snake. <laughs> that, yeah, one snake, and you better take care of it or we're going to take it away, yeah. Oh, man, hey, like so, I said before, Rance, you're not exactly a household name yet in the snake business, but... We, we got to no. get your uh, we got to get your monarch story on, and then we're going to get into okay. uh, a couple other things that you know people are most likely going to want to know about. So let's hear about this monarch. All right. Well, some of you read the story. Um, for those that haven't, you know, this dates back to 1999. Um, I was actually going up to uh, Chicago to pick up some arboreal cages, so it's kind of weird that this is coming full circle, and I'm going to be back there, uh, you know, selling some of these heads now, but. Yeah, I just uh, I got a lead on my way up there that I was uh, uh, a gentleman had uh, some pastels for sale. You know, in 1999, those weren't exactly uh, you know they were one of the the premier morphs at the time. Uh, so I was I was reluctant that they were actually pastels. And then you know I meet the guy, and I didn't think they were pastels. Okay, they just were. If they were, they were the ugliest pastels I'd ever seen in my life. But um, you know, he was really wanting to sell them. So I picked them up, brought them home, put them in my collection. And in 1999, my collection consisted of one snake, a female ball python. That's all I had. Okay. So I picked up this pair of uh, extremely ugly pastels, brought them home. Over the course of, you know, 10 years, they just didn't do well. Um, they hardly ate. Um, you know, they wouldn't breathe. They wouldn't this, they wouldn't that. You know, so I, you know, I did my best to, you know, to, to work with them and then, uh, uh, finally, in uh, 2009, I got a clutch out of that female. Wow! And, you know, I'm a, and uh, I say I, I say a clutch. I got two eggs. That oh my god! Eggs. Wow! Yeah. Talk about well, freaking tenacity, man! I give you I give you <laughs> massive props for that. That is amazing. So many people just they they get in and they bail if it doesn't go good <laughs> the first season. <laughs> That's amazing. Right. That's just amazing. Exactly. Keep going, brother. Let's hear it. 
So uh, just probably I'll tell you one, one last thing before I, I get too deep in the story. But um, in 1995, I got a summertime job working for Bob Clark Reptiles here in Oklahoma City. So, you know, during this time, I was working for Bob. You know, I worked for him up until 2007. So, you know, I learned a lot with with Bob over the time, you know, on snakes that wouldn't eat and just, just reptiles in general. I learned a great, great deal from, from him and my time there. So um, back to the, the story here, I... Uh, you know, I worked with these snakes, got them to breed finally in, in October 2009. I made two eggs. So, you know, I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to get some normal pastel, maybe super pastels, if these ugly snakes are in fact pastels. So um, the eggs hatch, um, and, and I had no idea what they were. Uh, they were One was striped looking. I thought, man, that looks similar to a genetic stripe. But I'm thinking, well, that, that just can't be because there's virtually no one working with genetic stripes right now. It was probably Bob was the only one. I, maybe. There could have been some others, but he was one of them. Anyway, they, they hatched out, and, uh, you know, I took them around and showed them to some people, and uh, no one really knew what they were. You know, I took them to, to Bob, obviously. I took them to Mike Wilbank. Um, they just they just no one knew. Nobody knew what they were. So um, I thought, okay, well, uh, it looks burgundy-ish. I, I just didn't know what it was. Anyway, um, thought well, I'm just gonna raise them up, and uh, and in that clutch, I got a male and a female. Hmm. And today, today we know that 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 male that I hatched is the monarch pastel. So, and then the female we know now is the monarch pastel genetic stripe. Hmm. Well, if you, if you breed those two snakes together, come to find out, we now know that they were the pastels were indeed pastels. But they were also double head for what we now know is monarch and head for genetic strike. God, so, what are the odds of that, man? Did you ever run the odds? Yeah. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one of the guys yeah. on the boards to run the odds for that. <laughs> yeah, well just from that that two breeding, those two pastels being uh double heads, um, you have thirty possible combinations. So essentially I hit two and sixty four chance uh, on both those animals. I had a two and sixty four chance of, of producing the monarch pastel, the monarch pastel genetic strike. Like a three point one two percent chance. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> the that's the odds of the actual of the of the of the breeding outcome, but yes. the odds of actually digging up a freaking snake that had you know none of this other stuff on its resume before, you know, I mean that's just a miracle. Yeah. <laughs> Let it rip, well, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. I know. I mean, I, I, would, I would hope I'd have a better chance at winning the lottery, but I haven't done that yet either. So yeah, just a really uh, amazing deal. So bred those in uh, October two thousand nine and uh, raised them up, and uh, uh, the following year, a year and a half later, which would have been uh, July 2011, I bred those uh, those uh, original double heads back together. Well, in this uh, clutch, I got seven eggs, which I'm thinking, okay, this is good. This will kind of maybe answer some more questions. Well, in that pairing, I got a pair of super pastels. I got one genetic stripe, one pastel genetic stripe, one super pastel genetic stripe, and in this clutch, we got the single gene monarch and a monarch genetic stripe. Hmm. So now I can take this this monarch, which I'm thinking, okay, this has got to be the single gene animal. So I compare it to the monarch pastel and then, uh, um, you know, kind of put them all together. So at this point, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm understanding this. These, these snakes are obviously double head for this new gene, which I've named monarch and genetic stripe. So still in that second ch- clutch, you know, um, throwing that monarch and that monarch to next try for just the odds were just astronomical. One in 64, I think, is what it, it comes out to be. Um, so those are the only two clutches um, of visuals that I have produced up until this month, which is when um, I hatched up the new visuals that uh, some of you have seen uh, photographs on. Yeah, if but, anybody hasn't seen these yet, you got to get up up on the uh, on the Bush League Breeders Club boards, and uh, they're in the uh, Bull Python Pictures thread, if I recall, Rance. Uh huh. That's correct. Okay, so get up in there and go check out Rance's thread. These things are incredible. If you're a BP fan, you got to see them. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, they're very nice. So anyway, that original male monarch pastel that I hatched, I, I've raised him up, and uh, you know I've bred him to a, a normal a pastel a mahogany and a fire, and I've produced a um, a handful of clutches uh, of heads, 100% heads, that I'm now raising up to, you know, uh, build my breeding stock. And then uh, just this year, I bred that that monarch pastel male from the first visual clutch back to his mother. So now I'm breeding the head to 
or a visual to a head, so I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to get some good stuff out of this. Well, I got I got eight eggs, and uh, in that clutch, um, which just hatched this month, about three and a half, four weeks ago, I got uh, a normal pastel. I got a few more monarch pastels, and then I also produced for the first time the monarch super pastel, which in the photographs, you know, you can see the difference. It's much lighter in color. And, uh, you know, I'm very excited about that because I know how light in color the Monarch Pastel has turned out as an adult. So, you know, I'm hoping the Monarch Super Pastel is even going to be, you know, lighter in color and just, you know, just mind-blowing. So that's, that's exciting to think about. Um, oh, yeah, man. In this, this, <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to say one thing in this whole deal. It's crazy that after 10 years, I bred these two pastels together. And I think part of the reason I did is because I'm, I'm such a small breeder CK that I didn't have a lot of other options, you know, so I threw these guys back together, you know, and I threw them together just thinking, okay, I'll get some pastels and maybe some supers, and uh, and then this is what popped out. But had I not done that, this gene probably would have never surfaced. Oh, you know what? If, if, honestly, if you were, I mean, even just if you were me, like, mm-hmm. you know, after 10 years, you get so many more cool things in your collection. The last thing you're trying to produce is pastels or super pastels. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the, exactly. the tailings of, you know, the other things you try to make. So it really is truly a, a a lining up of all the coincidences to make this happen, which really makes this a miracle as far as I'm concerned, the way you dug this out, man. And it's just a, it's a, it's the total, the total apex of <laughs> tenacity and not giving up. <laughs> and it's like, it's just so amazing how you, uh, how you how you made this happen, man. And of course, the massive amount of luck to hit those crazy odds. Truly yeah. stunning. Yeah. Truly and stunning. I'm not usually a lucky guy, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, I'm really stoked for you because I love I love these kind of stories where you know someone just you know who's it's like it's it's I hate to cliche it again, but it's the Cinderella story, man. You just kept doing it, you kept doing it, you kept doing it, and finally your prince popped out of the egg. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's great. So now clearly you're a small time breeder, and you know from from the sound of it, you haven't got huge since uh, since then because you still you know this sounds like it's obviously going to be your main focus for a while is this uh this particular morph right yeah absolutely you know it really is um you know i'm i'm certainly not a big breeder by any stretch of the imagination you know i'm not uh, i don't think people would label label me as a big breeder i don't think they would label me as a as a small breeder but you know get this and i and i like this term ck i don't even know if you've heard of it before but i i like to consider myself a micro breeder mm-hmm. <laughs> no that's if cool people you've heard of that but, you know, I just don't have a lot of animals. I have uh, tw- about 20 adult females, and, and they're not just uh, over-the-top morphs. I mean, I'm talking pastels, mojaves, fires, and, uh, you know, so just run-of-the-mill stuff. Um, yeah. And, and only out of two of those 20, only two of those carry the monarch gene. So, you know, I don't have a lot. I have four small animal plastic racks, you know, that each hold about nine, nine uh, uh, rubber maids. I have one sub-adult rack and one, one baby rack and a uh, small little incubator. Uh used to be a little uh, a wine cooler that I got for cheap, uh, rip, ripped the compressor out of it and turned it into a small incubator, and I, I think it holds like six clutches max. Nice. Um, you are 100% bush league, my brother. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, you're praying that the cool. animals are going to wait until something hatches before they lay. I mean, I've been through that. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. So yeah, I'm certainly just a just a small guy, you know. I, I don't uh, have a lot of desire to get huge. Uh, um, you know, I would certainly maybe like to grab some of these uh, uh, newer morphs, but uh, I think being small, you know, well, really small, kind of allows me to to really focus on on my collection. And uh, you know, I don't think I'll ever get burnt out in that sense. Um, so you know, for me, it, it works well. Um, and man, I just I really enjoy it. And, and this monarch thing has just come along. And it's, you know, kind of uh, just, you know, sparked things, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to be working with it. I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it has a tremendous amount of potential. And even if I don't have the ability to put it to a ton of different morphs and make all these new combinations, I know there's plenty of people out there that do, and that is exciting to think about what could be done with this gene. Oh, yeah. It's really, it's 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 a clean-up gene like the Desert Ghost. It's also recessive, which is going to give it long staying power. It's just that the, the main difference between the ghost and, and, and this thing is that it, it pumps the color back in, where ghost kind of, 
you know, takes some color back out and just cleans all the all the noise out of the the thing. This actually adds color, man. It's, it just pops so much. I just love it. I I mean, that's amazing. It's an amazing beast. It's kind of kind of it's kind of kind of has a little bit of a like a the the caramel. Uh, what's that other caramel uh-huh. thing called? The ultramel thing. It's got like an ultramel look to it, but it doesn't exactly. trash any of the other other patterns. Like the things come out true to their pattern. They just ramped up and cleaned up. You know, that's the amazing part. So yeah, they, they really are. It's really like a, a very unique, very unique gene, man. I, I'm really stoked that it's out there now, and you know, maybe someday I'll be big enough like you and own one. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, big enough, yeah, maybe. Hey, man, I honestly have the same size collection as you. When you were running down the rack sizes, I mean, I'm replacing all my racks because of the flood, because everything got destroyed. You know, melamine doesn't hold up good in salt water. <laughs> no, <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's you know, it's all cool, man. It's it's really dynamite. I'm stoked that uh, that you're in this position because you're in a, in a great spot, man. It's really nice. Now, listen, public opinion on the boards generally feels that you did a great job managing this project so far. And uh, now, what do you feel is the like the next most important part of how you manage the rest of the project? Well, you know, I think early on in the project, you know, I think for me, it was just, as with most things that I do, it's just staying true to myself and, you know, kind of kind of what I, you know, how I was raised and uh, the morals and values that I, that I bring along. Um, you know, I do know early on in this project, I'll tell you guys that, you know, I was offered a nice sum of money for a few of the select individuals. And I think at the time there were only four snakes. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I, I just really didn't feel comfortable selling selling the gene when I, I didn't know what was going on with it. And I realized that the person that was interested, you know, was, was willing to assume that risk, you know, for, for the potential. But uh, I, I just I, I kindly declined the offer. And, uh, you know, I just knew how much fun it was going to be to, uh, you know, keep breeding the animals out and then trying to piece this puzzle together. That's and, great. So, yeah, but That's now, where I'm at now, that I'm, I'm releasing some uh, heads for the first time, and, and actually it's, it's four years to the date um, from when I produced the, the first two-egg clutch. Hmm. So that, that's pretty exciting. So, yeah, it's been four years in the making. Um, but now that I'm, I'm offering up some animals for sale, I think my – focus is, you know, honestly, just to make sure that the people that invest in this project are, are happy, because there, there really is nothing that would turn my stomach more than to, you know, allow someone to invest in this that wanted to be in it, was excited about it, you know, they spent the money to get into it, and then at any point along the road, they they would have buyer's remorse, you know, I, I don't want that to happen, you know, yeah, I, I feel, or, I, yeah go ahead. I mean, I appreciate your concern. I'm not seeing the buyer's remorse uh, coming into the picture because, <clears throat> I mean, you definitely kept this close to your chest. And it's, you know, this, it's not like you're out there whoring the heck out of this uh, this, gen- this gene. And there, we all know there isn't a lot of them out there because, you, I mean, you have what's available. <laughs> so. Yeah, you, you, you nailed it right there. Um, there are none out there. Uh, I, I've held on to every animal so far. So uh, the, the gene is, is here with me. But, you know, I'll tell you, CK, I'm, I'm actually excited to announce that uh, the first investor has, has come through, and uh, that gentleman is Tom Harbin. So oh, he that's is, really he, nice. I mean, I hope you cleared he, with him that you were going to say his name on the show. I did. I oh, good, good, did. good. Because, no. I mean, we, we've had Tom on the show, and he's a great guest, and he's, he's a very lovable guy. You pass yeah. him by. You pass his table at Tinley. He's the mad professor behind the booth. You know? I mean, I, I love the guy, but yeah, I just I, I don't like to just throw names out there. But I'm glad you already cleared that. So, and I know Tom is a gentleman, so he probably wouldn't have an issue with it anyway. But that right. that's great. So that that's that says a lot, man, because Tom Tom has a phenomenal eye for stuff. Yes, he does. Yeah, like you said, a true gentleman. Um, but yeah, like you just said, you you were happy that I cleared it with Tom, and you know that. And I, I spoke with Tom. And uh, you know, I said, listen. I said, I feel it, it's 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 yours to uh, share with people. I think you should be the one that uh, um, you know tells people that you invested in this project. Uh, and uh, because I don't, uh, you know, want to want to do that, so I think that uh, you should be able to do that. And he said, you know, he said, I certainly don't mind if if you uh, tell people. So you know, like I said, uh, thanks, Tom, uh, uh, for investing in the project. I think you're going to be very happy with it. And um, so yeah, that's that's just kind of where I'm at as far as managing things now, just to keep uh, the investors excited about it, uh, make make good decisions, 
And, uh, you know, just in the end, it just comes down to the love of the animal. I mean, it has to. Um, Without a doubt. So, you know, I, I mean, so. look, me and you feel that way, and I know Tom Harbin feels that way, but not everybody feels that way. A lot of people are about the love of the buck, and it's kind of a drag right. because n- none of us ever got into it. Well, I can't say none of us, but most of us didn't get into this because of the love of the buck. But, you know, your project okay. has uh, has an element of both in it, and you just hope that uh, people treat it with the, the way you'd like it treated. But, you know, you realize that's going to ultimately be out of your control at some point. It's just nice to ride the wave for as long as you can, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's cool, man. Now, uh, how'd you come up with the name Monarch? <laughs> uh, this is kind of an interesting story. It's not very long, but, uh, you know, just the color of the snake, you know, had such an intense orange. So I knew I wanted a name that, you know, uh, would in, in some way reflect that. And uh, I know this sounds crazy, but it's it's the truth. I was at the, the fire station one day, and we were uh, uh, cleaning the fire truck on Friday. That's kind of what we do. And uh, got around to uh, the front of the uh, engine, and uh, well, lo and behold, there was a dead monarch butterfly in the grill. No, and no. I kind of pulled that, yeah, I pulled that thing off there, and I was looking at it, and I thought, and it just kind of clicked. I thought, you know, that orange is so similar to the orange and the snakes I have at the house, and and that was it, the monarch. I know it, you know, crazy. it would be a great story if it was a live monarch that landed on your helmet or something, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would have been really good. Uh, a roadkill yeah. monarch. <laughs> roadkill monarch. That, uh, that is it. Uh, that's rough. Not too fancy, but that's, that's how it came about. So. <laughs> that's rough.